It's my pleasure to welcome Nicholas Pinnock. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, How are Hi. you? Very well, thank you. <laughs> I want to ask you, first of all, how did you first become aware of this project? And what was your visceral reaction when you first read this script? So ABC and I have been talking for um, a good few years about the possibility of working on something together. And it just had to be the right project at the right time. Um, and uh, I think it was last, last February, no, February before, um, they asked me to have a look at this and if I was interested to uh, say yes and come on board. And um, when I first read it, I had my reservations about a few things, but then I spoke to uh, the creatives, um, George Tillman, who directed the pilot episode, and Hank Steinberg, who was the creator of the show. We had long, long chats about, you know, who Aaron was and, um, you know, things that I felt, things that they felt, and it just became very, very clear. That this is a, a role I had to be a part of. And how does it affect your performance that your character is based on one of the show's creators, writers? And what part of your research for this character did that play, that it was based on a living person? I mean, it's obviously a lot more of a responsibility with this role than, um, you know, most other roles when you're playing somebody who is, uh, you know, alive and, and kicking and you're having to emulate a version of them, but because it's inspired by and not based on, I didn't have to look like Isaac and I didn't have to sound like Isaac, but there was a version of him that I was playing. So there were essences of him that I wanted to add to Aaron, which um, from what his family tell me, uh, I have managed to do. Um, and, you know, my research was spending time with him for the most part, and then speaking to some formerly incarcerated men and women understanding what that life was like, understanding how frustrating it would have been. Um, Isaac's situation was very different though because he was innocent. He was falsely and illegally in prison. And so some of the things he had to say compared to some of the things that ex-prisoners had to say, well, you know, there was, there was slight differences in, in the way that they approached life and their, their time inside. Um, so Isaac was my main source of um, research really. The show is very cinematic and the scripts obviously are superb. I'm wondering how far in advance do you receive those scripts and how much rehearsal do you get? Um, so last season, we had um, a certain amount of rehearsal because you know we would, what we would do, the, the director and the actors would stay on set and rehearse until we were ready. And then the cameras would come and find where we were. Because of COVID now, um, things have changed. So uh, we don't get that rehearsal process, but we've managed to start rehearsing on camera. Um, so that's, that's been a, a, a different aspect to it all. And it's, um, you know, filming has been uh, just, just a great experience. I mean, we get, we get the scripts sometimes a week before we film. Um, and depending on how early or late they are, um, two weeks before or sometimes a few days before. But we generally, you know, getting them in, a, in good enough time to have a table read and, uh, you know, enough time to absorb and send back notes and um, understand what it is we're doing before we put it on screen. Yeah, that's great. And you're working with an absolutely stellar cast of actors, Indira and Timothy, Mary. I mean, it's an amazing cast of characters. How much of your performance is predetermined and how much depends on your reactions to the other characters in the scene, in the moment? So we have an idea, you know, I personally, I have an idea when I read the script, depending on and based upon where Aaron was before and what his mentality is like and what his mood and situation is like. So I have an idea, a, a kind of a broad strokes of what it is that I need to bring into the scene as far as Aaron is concerned. But then once I'm in a scene with Timothy and Indira or Joy, um, what they bring and what I bring, we have to kind of marry and see if they work. If they don't, we adapt very quickly um, because there's no point in me coming so fully set with what I have to do um, and not be able to change and work with them and play basically. You know, I'm, they're handing me something, I'm giving something back and that back and forth 
um, you know, exchange is really, really important. And what you'll find is it will change from take to take because you'll find something in the first few takes that you thought, oh, that's, that was interesting. We play more of that. And then by the time you get to the last set of takes, you know, they're very, very different to how we started because you become more relaxed and you find new things and, you know, the movement and the rhythm of the dialogue just seems to change and become something, it just, it grows within the space of, you know, a few minutes sometimes. Yeah, that's wonderful that you have time and space to develop that. Mm -hmm. Some shows seem to go so quickly that... Well, it's very important with a piece like this because it's so complex and convoluted and it is inspired by true events. So you have to find a certain amount of authenticity to it that... Um, and that's, that's why rehearsals for us are very important, you know, to really understand what it is we're doing before we commit it to a film. And it shows, I think this is one, your performance is one of the most comp compelling performances on television. And so, yeah, no, thank you. I want to note that you and I actually went to performing arts school in London and we yeah. had a Shakespeare teacher, Mrs. Williams, who maintained that actors are intelligent people, um, which I still think about. And I'm wondering what have you taken away from that training, that very specific training? Wow, I mean, for me personally, I was able to just explore without any um, restrictions. I think that was a one good thing about the school that we went to was they just wanted you to explore and grow and just try as many things and do it in as many ways as possible. Um, and we were lucky to have a certain amount of teachers there. And a lot of the teachers, I was discussing this with an actor on set today actually, um, because he teaches and he's a working actor. And most of our teachers you could have seen on the television or on the West End stage. And so they were, you know, we were able to actually see on TV or on stage what it was that they were teaching us. We, we, get, we got to see it in motion. And so that was a real help. And I took that, you know, I took a lot of those things away from it, definitely. Your Bronx accent in this show is absolutely impeccable. How have you produced, how have you arrived at this perfect accent? Um, well, thank you, first of all, that's a <laughs> compliment. Um, I spent a lot of time um, in that area, just listening to people and understanding the, the, you know, the cadences and the rhythms and the accent, but also then having to um, get rid of that to a certain degree and translate that into what it is I have to learn from the script. Um, so a mixture of those two things and trying to make that authentic. And then I've got a wonderful dialect coach that I work with, um, who is just, he's just wonderful. Just wonderful. Jerome Butler, he's, he's an amazing individual. And, you know, he, you know, he comes in and he says one or two words on set and then he and leaves and that's it for the day. You know, he inspires me to just, you know, remember, remember this thing and that thing will stick with me for the whole day. But um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's, um, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of walking around and listening. And when I'm not doing interviews, I'm in accent all the time. And so just keeping the accent the whole time while I'm filming. So since we started in August, right through to the end of um, January, most people who see me will hear me in the Bronx accent. Oh, that's, that's an interesting tidbit. You also, um, you have a background in dance. You're obviously very fit. Can you talk about the importance of your physicality to this character, Aaron Wallace? So um, I have to get massages every weekend because my physicality and Aaron's physicality are very, very different and his body kills me. Um, my dance training luckily has helped me be able to stabilize him so it doesn't hurt as much, but his, his shoulders are hunched forward. And that was designed um, out of the fact that he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders and the oppression of prison and the life that he was living in prison was holding him down. So his, his, uh, his shoulders are hunched forward. His, um, his arms are kind of relaxed in front of him and you'll never see him put his hands in his pockets, even on the outside, because he's constantly alert and ready for any danger that may come his way. He then walks with his feet in a, um, if anybody who knows about ballet will be in a, in a um, first turnout, basically, <laughs> first position. Um, and that kind of allows him to move in a certain way that is um, just ready to move this way or that way. 
And so I have to, every take and every scene, morph into him physically. And that helps with where his accent is. And there's a, 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 a gravelly kind of texture to his voice. And I researched that in some emotional and traumatic cases, um, people's senses and people's um, vocal tone will shift and change emotionally. And so if you look in season one, when you see him in the flashbacks, his voice, his tone, the tone of his voice is a lot lighter and smoother, but thereafter it becomes more gravelly and ingrained in you know, who he is. Um, and so there's a, lot, there's a lot of Aaron is a complete shift from who I am as a person. And kudos to you, all of that stuff is completely seamless. You know, it, it just feels like a holistic whole of this real person. And yet technically we understand, hmm. you know, how much work you're putting into it. It's amazing. Your character's emotional journey really draws the audience in. And yet your performance is so supple and powerful. Um, how do you carve out those nonverbal beats? Because so much of it, 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 so much of the storytelling, your story is in those nonverbal moments. Aaron is constantly thinking. He's constantly mapping out things and he listens and he, you know, judges the situation. And he's kind of, his main focus is, I want to get out of prison. I want to get back to my wife and my family. Um, and so, one of the things that Isaac told me, because I asked him, I said, how did you get through all of those years in prison and not, you know, completely lose your shit, basically? Um, and he said he didn't have time for any emotion, not happy, not anger, not sadness, not regret, not loss. He said he didn't have time for it. It was just sheer focus on getting out. Once he got out, then he found the time to express how he felt. But if he lost focus for one second, he felt that that would have, you know, pushed him off of his train of, you know, determination. And so I tried to marry that also with the emotional beats for a drama that you need. So there's a certain amount of focus, but then there's the emotional aspect on what he's thinking, what he's feeling, what he's going through on top of that. So his moments of anger are very short and very private. Um, for the most part, um, so trying to contain that he's almost, almost there, but then doesn't quite blow it. But then when you see him blow it, it really has an impact and it really makes a difference. And when you see him cry or, you know, feel regret or sadness, those moments were very important to show, not constantly, but when, the, but when they were shown, they had to be earned. And that was the thing, you have to earn those moments. I think it's amazing the way you analyze the script. I mean, your vulnerability, you're so right. The, the, these brief moments where we have these insights into this deep hurt and this, how do you decide this is a moment where I can, you know, where he's furious, but he's obviously going to pull it back. How, how do you, when you read the script and you don't know what's coming next week, you only know what's come before, how do you decide this is the moment when I reveal whatever this emotion is? Um, that, I mean, I, I speak to the writers quite a lot and I speak to uh, the showrunner quite a lot. So we talk about what's to come because I come with sometimes, you know, a lot of ideas and, and questions and things. Um, and it's just feeling it in the moment a lot of the time because sometimes it will say Aaron cries. <laughs> and then you, then you look at it and from, and I, and I understand it from a writer's point of view, you want these dramatic moments, you want these beats, you want this, you know, stretch of emotion that his character hasn't shown previously. But then in the moment, and when you read it, you go, actually, now it's not the right time. This, this beat, I can't really, I'm not feeling that this is right yet. And it hasn't been earned yet because X, Y, and Z hasn't happened yet. So this is maybe too early. So, but I understand where it's coming from. I'll play something. And thankfully, um, they have trusted me and, um, and I trust them too. So it's, a very, it's very much a, a collaborative understanding that if I am going to change something, it's, it's purely for the story and not for anything else. The storytelling is fascinating. This dichotomy between the court intrigue, the legal drama and the prison, the politics of being an inmate in prison. I don't think it's something I've ever seen before. 
Um, and it's interesting the way Aaron, you've talked about this a little bit before, about the way he navigates those different environments. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you, you as the actor, navigate those scenarios? Um, so it's, it's just about, I mean, I read and I read and I reread every single scene. And there's a, for me, there is a, um, there's a melody in the dialogue and there's a rhythm and I try in every scene, it's almost like singing. And I kind of try and find the melody for that scene. And if that melody for that scene doesn't match the melody for the next scene, I have to go back and rethink the melody. And I need to find that common thread right the way through. Because if, the, um, if I'm, I feel that if I miss a beat, that could, shift everything badly and the editor's going to have a really, really rough time in trying to make it something that's, you know, um, pleasing for the audience to actually see and not be confused by and actually find that level of emotion, that hum all the way through. Um, and the writing is so good and I am so, um, you know, fortunate to be gifted with such wonderful um, story. And it's, and this story is, you know, for a, net, for a network show, it's beyond anything I've read before, because I've read for network shows before and turned them down. Because, you know, personally, I, I felt they'd been a bit too fluffy for me, and there wasn't enough challenge in them. Um, this is by far the most challenging piece of work that I've done, because what a lot of people don't realize also, and to add to, to your question was, I'm playing five or six different versions of Aaron. Well, six now in season two, but five different versions in season one. There is Aaron, the prisoner rep. There is Aaron, the prisoner. There's Aaron, the father and the husband in the meeting rooms with Jazz and um, uh, Marie. There is Aaron, who, who he has to be with Sophia Masri. And then there's Aaron, the lawyer. Yeah. And so those are five different code shifts that we had to find. So his physicality is ever so slightly different. The way he speaks is ever so slightly different um, in all of those different scenarios. Um, and then we had the flashback episode, so that's six. In the new season, we now see him and he's out of prison. So that's seven different small shifts of versions of Aaron that I have to play. Um, and so when you look at it that way, there, you can't for one second take your eye off the ball. You can't miss that beat. You can't miss that tiny detail that will make the scene good and not great. And so you have to try and go for great every single time. Well, your attention to detail and that complexity is what makes this a great network show. You talked a little bit about um, Hank Steinberg, the showrunners, the writers, and that you have a great relationship with them. And it struck me when I watched the first season that, you know, you were making this before Breonna Taylor, before George Floyd, before the global protests we saw in May and June. You're playing the protagonist um, in a show that is about racial justice in a time when this is at the forefront of our conversation. So can you tell me um, what conversations our environment has provoked and how that may have affected season two? It's interesting. Um, before the unfortunate events of the summer happened, the show was relevant. And it was relevant because of the history of this country. Um, Again, unfortunately. So what happened over the summer just impacted and put so much more attention on the things that are going on um, that this show became a focal point because people were going, okay, we're locked indoors because of COVID. Um, we are wanting to, you know, we can't ignore the current events that are going on because this isn't something to be ignored but you also need some respite from a lot of the pain that a lot of people were going through. So they were gravitating towards television when they were watching things. And I'm saying this based on things that people through DMs and emails and people who are watching the show have told me. So it seems like they, 
through wanting to find content to look at, this came about because it reflected what it was that they were feeling. And so a lot of people gravitated towards this because it was the, it was the show for them to be able to understand more the situation that they didn't understand and they were learning about and they wanted to know more about and they wanted to, you know, get more of a connection with but not have it impact them so much because actually they can dissociate themselves because this is a drama but it was inspired by the true events that happened so it's kind of real life but not <laughs> so that was a good escape for them for from what i was from what i understand um and even more so this you know in season two we, we're not ignoring the events of covid and the black lives matter movement and we i mean we, there's no way we could and we wouldn't want to um, it, to be honest, it wasn't, apart from the COVID, the storyline wasn't going to be too far from where we're taking it in season two anyway, um, purely because these things were still relevant without the atrocities that happened over the summer, because those things have been happening. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they continue to happen. Um, but with George um, Floyd, his murder was was a modern day lynching. And I think that's what really struck the globe. And you realize this isn't just a, an American problem, this is a universal problem in some degree, because you had countries that don't have a large black community that were marching in solidarity saying no more. And that tells you a lot. And so this show um, just happened to be, just happened to be there. Um, and we now have the responsibility in season two to make it um, be there and, and mean the same thing as it did before. Touching on COVID a little bit, um, how have, I know you're in the middle of filming season two right now, how have COVID procedures changed? Not just your rehearsal time and onset procedures, but in, has it changed, you know, inmates in the yard? co-stars as guards has it changed the the fabric of the actors on set absolutely i mean there's so much protocol now um you know there's hand sanitizing stations pretty much you know every corner there are hand wipes available everywhere you turn everyone's wearing masks um we're in z different zones so zone a are the people who are actually on set and then there's zone A offset, then you have zone B, and then you have the different degrees of zone B and so, zone C and so on and so forth. I think it goes to zone F. And so zone, zone A people are, are the people on set, the actors and the only crew that need to be on set. Um, and I like to go in every morning and say hello to every single person on set. It's, that's not possible anymore. Not only that, you're masked up like this. So I can't tell who a new person is from an old person sometimes because they've not only got the masks on, they've got the shields on as well. And I have to say this, the crew are my absolute um, champions. They are amazing. I champion them so much because they wear the mask and the face shield for pretty much most of the day. They get there before anyone else does and they leave after anyone, or the, the actors anyway. They leave after we do. Um, in between setups, I can go back to my dressing room and I can take my face, my face mask off and have some respite from you know this appendage on my face, as necessary as it is. Um, they don't. Uh, and they really, really are, you know, the uh, they're the, they're the real workhorses and they are what they are wonderful. But it does change the dynamic between the actors. Um, we don't get the rehearsals. Uh, we can't, um, it, 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 what it does is there's a, there was a camaraderie that we had last year between the cast and the crew. And that's just been separated now. So it's a lot more serious on set um, because every tiny thing, we have to have the masks on until we are rolling. Um, and then in between each take, you know, the masks go back on. And it was very difficult to begin with. It was very difficult to begin with, but um, we've now gotten into a rhythm of it. And I mean, we wouldn't have it any other way because there's no way we'd be able to film the show without all of those things. Um, but we've gotten into a rhythm with, we've, I think we finally found a way that makes it work. And we are finding the best of the moments that we can on set. And it's, 
now in its own rhythm and it's become second nature almost now we're in masks and having all the PPE and knowing it's just it's just become routine that's good and has it shrunk the cast um yes we can't have as many uh background artists on set um it's shrunk the cast slightly we what we found is a lot more of the scenes are longer with less people generally you already had long scenes and thinking about the season finale with the da the ag where he's like threatening you in the yard that was such an amazing scene but they're already these long cinematic scenes it's like theater yeah I mean, Boris is amazing he was wonderful to work with mm -hmm. uh, and that was a uh, you know that was a really really you know not only an important scene because it was the you know end of the show but it was the first time that Boris and I really got to you know play yeah. so you saw these two characters who in some ways were very similar very, very similar in certain ways. And they were, you know, the nemesis of each other. They finally got to meet. So it was a very important scene. It was, it was great working with him. It was, a, it's a, it was an amazing culmination to that story. And now um, I want to, you know, for everybody who's watching, um, the season two does air this evening. It picks up this evening. And I'm wondering, can you tell us anything about where Aaron Wallace is headed in season two, because. Okay, I can tell you that he, um, he leaves prison in season two. And we focus a lot more on his relationship at home, not only with his wife, but with his daughter. Um, he, his relationship with Roswell grows as well, as far as, you know, lawyer yeah. and counselor concerned. He struggles with being outside, being on the outside again. Um, so everything that comes with the, you know, the massive shift from being, you know, he was in prison for nine years, which is borderline when you become institutionalized. So he was dragged away from that. And he's, there are still things that, you know, are different for him and finding it difficult. Um, and then we go into, uh, COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of new aspects of Aaron that we haven't seen before, a vulnerability that we've not seen in him before, uh, a fear that we haven't seen in him before, and lots of layers that we weren't able to uncover in season one, purely because he was um, incarcerated for the whole season. Um, so now that he's out, we get to see, um, see lots of different shades to who he is. Amazing. I'm really excited to watch the whole season. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nicholas. This has been Thank insightful. Thank you. Sure.